Today's stuff we're going to be learning is Baba Kamadaf Samach Zayin. Today's stuff is sponsored by Aunt Naomi and Adam Furziger in celebration of the birth of their granddaughter, Sylvie Ayala, daughter of Emily and Ben Sion, sister of Akiva. B'Shevach v'Hodaya l'Hashem. Mazal Tov. Okay, we're going to get started where, with a quick review of what we were up to. We had yesterday, Rabba started and said that Shinoi is Konen, by making a change in an object. Then already, if you steal an object, so let's say, let's go back to our examples, Ruth steals from Naomi an object, and Ruth then does something, turns it into something else. That belongs to Ruth now, to the extent now it's strange. What do you mean it belongs to her? Well, again, what it means is that when she returns the item to Naomi, she actually doesn't need to return the item. She obviously has to return the value. She pays kefel if it's an animal, you know, that is liable for our Rav HaMisha. All that, of course, she has to compensate Naomi, but Ruth does not have to pay, give her the actual item because it's already not the same item. That was Shinoi. Then we discussed, what about Yeush? What if just after Ruth steals the object from Naomi, Naomi says, oh, I'll never get this back again. And then Naomi basically gives up on despairs of ever having it. And does Naomi acquire it? So Rebbe continued and said, yes, Ruth, I'm sorry, Ruth acquires it as well in that case. Okay, Ruth stole it. Naomi basically says, I don't want it anymore, which means it's somewhat ownerless. Again, we talked about that maybe it's, it's completely ownerless, which is why when it's in Ruth's possession, then she becomes the owner. Or perhaps we say that it's just that there's room for someone to basically say, I want this as mine, which is minor differences. We're not going to get into that really in the context of Adap Yomi Shir. But there are potentially conceptual differences here. Then we said that Rabbi Yosef says, Yehush alone is not Kona. And then we had to figure out, well, you know, we asked two questions on Rabbi's approach. So then we got away from Shinoi. We will come back to Shinoi again today. And then we dealt with Yehush. Is Yehush alone Kone or not? So Rabbi thinks, yes, Ruth becomes the owner. And again, all the ramifications of becoming the owner. But according to Rabbi Yosef, no, Yehush by itself doesn't work. To which we asked, so we had two questions against Rabbi, we resolved them. Then we moved to question, Abai questioned Rabbi Yosef from the Orot Shabal Abai, right? If you have, you have a hide, and then you turn it into something, right? You, or we saw the case if you steal it. And just, right, if you steal it, depending on which type of gezel, geneva, we had a debate, but that is not our issue. But at least in one case, we assume that you, by your thoughts alone, Ruth, who stole this hide, decides to use it as her cover for the tablecloth. She can now turn this into, right, let's say she decides I'm using this hide to cover my couch, I'm using it to cover whatever. Even though she didn't do anything to it, it sounds like, then already she can create the susceptibility to impurity, which she can only do, obviously, if she's the owner. So it must be that by Naomi being doing Yeush and saying, I'll never get this back again, that must be what's going on here. And that's why Ruth can determine whether it's susceptible to impurity or not. To which the Gemara said, What are you talking about? It's not that Ruth didn't do anything to it. No, she did some action to it. And then it's a minor action, like trimming the edges. But that minor action, that's called kitzan in the Gemara. That minor action is enough combined with Yehush. Yehush with a minor action, then yes. But Yehush by itself, no. By the way, later on today, um, Rabbani Yafi Klimer Shir is going to go up, which is all about machshava. A fascinating thing that just by your mind alone, by you thinking to use it as a tablecloth, that can change its status. And in general, in halacha, you know, we, there, we, there's always a debate. Machshava versus Maaseh. So basically, that's going to be an, uh, a shear that will be up on our site in a little while, uh, which also, by the way, you can find on the podcast if you've, if you've subscribed to our new podcast app so or the new podcast uh, series. So it'll be on there. It'll be on the DAF. If you haven't yet and you want to be part of it, you can. And then it hopefully will download automatically to whatever device you're using, which every time there's new material, you'll just get it to you, which makes it simpler. Anyway, this whole idea now is you must have done something to Yeush and some sort of small action. And then they said, but wait, how can you possibly say that Mishnah's talking about that? That's a Mishnah in Kalin. And the Mishnah right before it, which this is a continuation of, was talking about even itzba. Now, itzba is when you just take the hive, like we said originally, and just decide I'm going to use it as a tablecloth. But you don't actually do any action. You don't trim the edges. You don't do anything. 
So it sounds like Yerush by itself should work. To which Rava said, right, this Rava, Rav Yosef, you know, Rava raised this as a question against Rav Yosef for 22 years, all the years that Rava was the Rosh Hashiva, before Rav Yosef took over. Only once Rava, Rava died and Rav Yosef took over did he answer this question. So he answers, well, there's Shinoi Hashem. You change the name because Itzba is not the same as Hyde. Originally, it's called Mashka. That's where we ended yesterday. And once you decide to use it as your tablecloth, it's already called Aberzin. And therefore, it's something different. So now we have two approaches within Rav Yosef, which are the same, really, which is Yeosh with either a mild change, like trimming the edges, or changing the name. That will give you will give Ruth the ownership. But with just Yeosh, no. Now, the Gemara has some more questions on this because they say, and that's where we're going to start today, Baham Maresh, but we're going to give an example of a beam that we talked about. If you build a beam and you use it for your roof, then you don't have to return the beam. But why don't you have to return the beam? Now, generally, if you say Yeyush is Kone, right, or Chino Yashem, you'd say that's why you don't have to return the beam. Because originally it was called a beam, now it's called your roof. Okay? But, so let's read that. Maresh, the Ika Chino Yashem. It has a change in name, which according to what we just said, should be enough to make Ruth the owner and she only has to pay back Naomi the value. But the Me'ikara Kashura, right? Because originally it was called a Kashura, which is a beam. Bahashta Tlala. And now it's called Tlala, by the way, Tet switches with Tzadi. In Hebrew, it's called Tzlala. Tzlala is a, is a covering, like a tarp. So then you call it your roof, basically. It's over your head. And it's not called a beam anymore. Utnan. And what does the Mishnah say about this? If you take a beam and you build it into your, your tower, Ruth did no longer, if Ruth built it into her house now, or whatever she used, a bira, whether it's a, it doesn't matter what, whatever she did, she built it into her roof, let's say. It's now on her ceiling. She doesn't have to return the item anymore, just the money. But why? Not because she acquired it with Yeyush and Shino Yashem and the name change. No. She acquires it because of this Takana that we've been talking about. In order to, to make thieves return items, it's going to be a big pain for Ruth to take down her house in order to return the beam, so she'll never return that beam. But in order to encourage her, we say, you know what? If you come and admit it, you'll just have to pay the value. You won't have to take it apart. But what do you infer from this? It's only because of this Takanada Shavim. Halav Hachi, if it weren't for that, Hadrabaini, she would have to return it, even though we had Shinoi Hashem. So that seems to go against our response that we have for Rav Yosef, which is Yehush and Shinoi Hashem should make Ruth the owner. According to this, Yehush and Shinoi Hashem doesn't make Ruth the owner. It's only because of this extra Takana, this other side issue, because we're worried Ruth will never return it, that we institute it. But without that, it sounds like it, would, it wouldn't be her. She'd have to return it. So I'm a Rav Yosef. Rav Yosef responds and he says, No, A beam is different because a beam is always called a beam, even if it's in your roof or your ceiling. Ditanya, how do we know this? Okay, this is the first answer. We're going to have two answers. Salotabai, we're now darshaning a pasuk in Yechezkel. It says it's talking about the building of the third temple and it says, Salotabai, Elu hamelatatim. So the, the bright says, these are the... Um, I can't think of the right word to say, but they're um, in cl- they're, uh, frames that are used like for the windows or things like that in order to to be able to put things in place. Okay, there's something along those lines. Ha'ubim elu uh, casings. Thank you. That's the word I couldn't think about. And ha'ubim elu ha'mireshot. The ubim that are mentioned in the pasuk, that's the mireshot, that's the beams that create the roof. So what do you see here? Even though they're in the roof, they're still called beams. So they don't actually change their name. If they would actually change their name, like, and now you'd have to assume, even though this is a little bit weird, the commentaries say this, but let's say this itzba, which we were saying, would have to be the kind of thing that it changes its name by you deciding, I'm going to use this as a cover for my table. It's already called an itzba, and if I now create shoes out of it, it's a little bit weird. They still call it an itzba. Okay, it's hard to know. We weren't there in the reality of those days to know really what things were called. But that's what you would have to assume because obviously we're comparing these two things. In one case, Shino Hashem works and the other one doesn't. It's because that Shino Hashem of Maresh isn't really real. It doesn't really get called roof. It's still called a beam. Called a beam in your roof. 
as opposed to the itzba, which takes on the name of itzba and doesn't go back. So now they say, um, or we'll see about the going back. That's really the second answer. Rabbi Zeira Amar, right? I, I jumped the gun a little, but basically, uh, so my mistake. That's really the second answer. The first answer is more simple, which is Marish is still called beam. It doesn't really change its name. Whereas itzba, when you put it on your table, it's no longer called a hide. It's called an itzba. The second answer, I accidentally combined with this one, which is Rabbi Zeira Amar, Shinoi Hazer Lebriato, if it's going to revert back to its name. So the way it works is like this. If you put it in your roof, it might be now called your roof and not called a beam anymore. But when you take it out of your roof, it's now called an, it's, it's now called a, a beam. It retains its original name. So that is not a real Shino Hashem. Whereas the itzba, and this is what we're going to say right now, that's what I've accidentally said earlier, it's a shinoi that's not chozer lebriato. Once you call it an itzba, it's always an itzba. So even if you put it, use it for shoes, and then you somehow, you know, you reuse it for something else, or you do something, it's always going to have the name itzba on it. Okay? It's, it's never going to change its name, revert back to being called a hide. So basically, again, it's a little hard to imagine why that is with an itzba, but you'd have to say that otherwise Rabbi Zeros doesn't really, his answer doesn't really make sense. So we're basically going to distinguish. So now we have this distinction. Okay, let's just go back and summarize. We have Rav, Rav Yosef, who says Yeush alone is not Kone. But if you have Yeush with a small, like trimming the leather hide and to make it into something, even though it's a minor change, that together with Yeush should work. Likewise, a Shino Hashem would work. However, according to these two possible answers, either it would have to be a real Shino Hashem and not something that still retains its original name, or would have to be something that will never revert back to being called this a real shinoi Hashem it has to be. It has to be a shinoi that's permanent rather than temporary. Okay? If it's temporary and it will revert back if you were to remove it from wherever it is and change it, then that wouldn't be called a shinoi Hashem that will work with Yehush to allow you to acquire it. We're still, though, struggling with Rabbi Yosef because now they're going to say, okay, so according to what you're saying, like the itzba, a shinoi Hashem, she'eno chozer lebriato, but wait, we're going to bring another source that seems to say, this is all within the first question we had on Rav Yosef, which was about the Machshavah Metama So now they say, so you want to say that if you have a Shinoi Hashem, that will not, like the Itzba, which will always now be called an Itzba and never go back, that's enough to call it a Shinoi? And meaning that Ruth is now going to be the owner of it and she won't have to return the actual item to Naomi? Well, Haret Sinor, what about a pipe? Okay, or something like a pipe here, we're going to see. We're now talking about a particular type of pipe that they used to, or a, a, a channel, that they used to channel water into the mikvah. So we need some background about mikvah. A mikvah has to be 40 se'ah. Once it's 40 se'ah of, of rainwater, okay, it has to be rainwater or moving water, but well, let's not get into that now. Let's say it's rainwater. But it can't come from water that you already collected in a vessel. That's called Mayim Shu'uvi, and that's disqualified. That's if it doesn't have 40 se'ah, and you want to fill in a little bit with Mayim Shu'uvi that was collected in a kli, it disqualifies the mikvah. If you're ready to have 40 se'ah, you can add some more Mayim Shu'uvi, that's fine. But if it didn't have 40 se'ah, you can't add any Mayim Shu'uvi. It will disqualify your mikvah. Again, Mayim Shu'uvi, Mayim that was collected in a vessel. The whole question is going to be, if I use this channel to get the water into the mikvah, when the water goes in the channel, is that considered it's in a vessel? Okay, so now we're going to talk about what this pipe looked like, okay, or this channel. What they did was they hollowed out a log, okay? It's like the way people pick out their bagels and they take out the inside. It's kind of like that. Imagine it in that way. So you have this log, and you basically take off probably some of the top and, and make a hole inside, but it's got, it's got it on the sides. It has to be somehow, right? It's not like a... Like, um, it has to somehow have like a bait kibu, we call a receptacle to accept, you know, where the water can go through and sit in, but you know, it's probably open at the top. Okay. So it's something like that where you basically take a log and then you cut out the inside of it. So there's two ways you can do this and it's going to all affect the halacha. Sinor shechakiko, okay, vitanya. So now, oh, sorry. So let's just start again. Haret sinor. So we have this pipe which is originally it was a 
called a katsitsta, which is basically a log, a cut piece of wood. Katsitsta milashon lekatsets is to cut. It's a cut piece of wood, so let's just call it a log. Vahashda tsinyora, and now it's called a pipe, a channel, whatever word you want to use, right? Modern Hebrew tsinyora is a pipe. Vitanya, and it's, there's a bright that says the following. Sino shechakiko. If you take this tsinyor, which really right now is a log, and you cut, you hollow it out, ulevasoch kavao. And then after it's hollowed out, you basically created a vessel. Then you stick it in the ground, because that's where it's going to go. It's going to basically take water from under the ground in one place to the mikvah in the other spot. And you put it, attach it to the ground. That's posel mikvah. Well, it was a kli. And now the water is going to sit in the kli as it goes before it goes into the mikvah. And the mikvah wasn't 40 se'ah, so you're going to disqualify your mikvah. But kiva'o, if you put that log into the ground first as a log, isn't a kli. And then levasov chakiko, and then you hollowed it out, eno posel to mikvah. Because a kli is something that's movable. It's not part of the, of the ground. If it's part of the ground, that's a different story. Since you put this log in the ground, it wasn't a kli. And then you fashioned it and turned it into a clee while it was in the ground, it's basically called something attached to the ground, which is not a vessel. So that wouldn't disqualify your mikvah. Now, what does this have to do with anything? Well, if you're going to say shino yashem, you, by calling something by name, it changes its status. Well, in the end, whether you put it in the ground first or you put it in the ground after you fashioned it into a, a water channel, this is now called a tsinor. Either which way you look at it, it's a tsinor. So therefore, once it's a tsinor, and you call it a tsinor, it should be called, it should be a kli. It shouldn't matter whether it was fashioned once it was attached to the ground or before. Either which way, it's called a tsinor, and a tsinor is a vessel, and therefore it should disqualify the mikvah. To which they answer, don't ask questions from laws of mikvah and mayim shuvim. Why? Because shani shi'ivadimi de rabbanani. This has nothing to do with our topic. Why does it have nothing to do with our topic? Theoretically, it would. But all the laws of Mayim Shuvim disqualifying a mikvah are all rabbinic. It's not such a serious issue, which means that we can be lenient if it, you put it in the ground first and fashion the, the, the vessel. While it was in the ground, we're not going to really view that as a vessel. But if it was a Torah issue, then theoretically, you were probably right. That once we call it a Tzinor, it will be a Tzinor. And then it has the Shino Hashem is, is significant. Okay, here the Shino Hashem doesn't matter, but that's because the whole halacha isn't so strict. Okay, which the Gemara asks, well, if the whole halacha is not so strict anyway, then why don't you say in the first case where you make, you fashion the vessel and then put it in the ground, since anyway, it's in the ground, maybe we won't view this as a vessel. Who cares what the order is? If we're already being lenient, maybe we'll be lenient there too. To which they answer, no, because there's obvious reasons. As we said before, Hatam Torah that, when it was detached from the ground and you fashioned the, the, the channel out of it, it was already called a vessel before you put it in the ground. You can't say it loses its status of vessel. It was a vessel, so now I stuck it in the ground. Of course, it's still a vessel, and therefore it will mess up your, your mikvah. But ha but in the case where you put the log into the ground as a log, ain't a rakliyala betalush. It didn't even, was never called a vessel, so we're not going to start calling it a vessel now. But again, that doesn't teach us anything about Shino Yashem. So we, after we, again, we started with this question on Rav Yosef. It seems like Eush is enough to acquire it based on that case of the machshava. With your own thoughts, Ruth could, after stealing something, decide the status of this object, which was obviously after Yeush. We thought that just Yeush alone would be Kone against Rav Yosef. We answered two possible ways, right? We could say, number one, it would be Yeush with a minor change, like trimming the edges, or Yeush with a Shinoi Hashem. And then we got into this problem of the Shinoi Hashem issue with the Maresh. We had two answers. One of the answers led us to distinguishing between a Shinoi that, a Shinoi Shem, a change in name that will revert back or a change in name that will never revert back. And then we said it would have to be that Rabbi Yosef holds Yeush and a Shinoi Hashem, which wouldn't revert back. And then we said, but here we have a case where the Tzinoi is never going to be called a log anymore. It's never going to go back to being a log. And yet we see that it's not significant. So we said, oh no, that's because this is a different issue. It's a rabbinic issue, and therefore we're, we're lenient with it. But it doesn't teach us anything about our topic. So that was all within the first question on Rav Yosef with the Mishnah in Kalim. Now we're going to go to another source, Metive. Haganav v'hagazlam v'ha'anas. We're now talking about three types of thieves. One who steals, one who steals face, right? One who steals secretly, that's the ganav. 
one who steals face to face, like a mug somebody, and the anas, which is force sale. Okay, that's someone who forces. You don't want to sell your item. The the thief comes and forces you. You know, perhaps at gunpoint to sell your item. Will give you the money for it, but forces you to sell it. Those three people. Once they steal it, so let's go back to Ruth. Ruth stole an item in one of these three methods and then decided to sanctify it to the temple. Hekidesh on Hekidesh, it's effective. Or she takes truma from it. Let's say it was Tevel, it was untied produce, and she takes truma again, right? She's not the most, uh, 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 not the best person. She's stealing things, but yet she has this idea of bringing things, sanctifying them for the temple. She takes her truma to Maslow. So if she takes truma ma'asil, the truma is valid, and ma'aschotam ma'asil, and the ma'asir is valid. So what do you see here? You have a case where Ruth becomes the owner of the object. Now, how could that possibly be if not that Naomi had Yeush? And what do you see here? Yeush alone is Kone because Ruth didn't do anything to the object. <clears throat> she just said, I'm sanctifying it. I'm taking truma from it. That's not a shinoi, or maybe it is. Well, Right now, we think it's not, and therefore, bringing is a question of Yosef. This is going to be a much simpler answer. It's not going to take us half a daf like it did uh, half a number like the previous. We're going to answer here. hatam ika shinoi Hashem. There's also a shinoi shame here because miikara tivla. It's called tevel to begin with, untied produce. Vahashda truma, and as soon as she separates it, right? The regular produce is called regular produce. Now it's not called tevel, and the truma is called truma. So there was a shinoi shame here. And hektesh, mikar chulin v'hashka hektesh. It's also called something different. It was called chulin, now it's called hektesh, right? Non-sacred, it became sacred. So there is a shinoi shame here, and therefore this isn't a question for Rav Yosef, because again, Rav Yosef holds, yegesh with shinoi hashem would work. Okay, now we're going to go back to shinoi. Okay, until now, we've been talking about Yeyush, although, of course, in the Yeyush discussion, we got into Shinoi, minor Shinoiim, like changing a name, which is not as major as changing an object, like building a vessel out of a piece of wood, or a minor Shinoi vessel, right, like cutting, trimming the edges, that together with Yeyush will be significant. But until now, we thought that everybody held that Shinoi by itself, if I take, if I take steel, if Ruth steals wood and turns it into a vessel, that will obviously be Kona. And on that, we're going to go back. That was the first statement of Rabbah, which Rav Yosef didn't disagree with. So comes Rav Chista now. Amar Rabbi Yonatan. He says in the name of Rabbi Yonatan, this is the first reading of what he says. We're going to have two versions. The first version, he's really saying verbatim what Rabbah said. Okay, and this was on, on Samach Vav Amud Aleph. Minayin l'shinoi shukone. How do we know that a shinoi, if you change an item, it becomes yours if you after stealing it, and then you only have to return the value. Shinema ve'shivet hagzela. Remember this pasuk? You have to return the stolen item. Matam alomar asher gazal. You don't have to say the stolen item that you stole. Obviously, it's the stolen item. It's the one you stole. Im ke'en shagazal yachzil v'im lav damim ba'alma ba'ay shilume. It's telling you if it's like asher gazal, it's like it was at the time you stole it, then you have to return it. If not, you only have to pay the value. And that teaches you shino kom. Now, this time we quote it, there's a question asked about it, which is, what do you mean? That pasuk there talks about that if you steal an item, okay, besides you have to return the item, you also have to pay this fifth added payment, and right, which is really a quarter, and you have to do bring a, a korban asha. This is if you admit it, right, and you want to atone for it. That's what you do. So now they're telling you, why does it say asher gazal? Not to teach you shinoi kone. Asher Gazal is to teach you the one that you stole. So let's say your father stole an item and before returning it, the father drops dead. So what do you do? You don't have to pay the Chomish, you just have to return the item, but you don't have to pay the extra fifth because it's not the one that you stole. It's someone else stole it, which makes sense, by the way. If it's all the purposes are for atonement, you don't have to atone for any sin, right? Whoever did is no longer alive and you don't have to atone for that. So... You learn something else from that pasuk. How can you derive it from this pasuk? To which the answer, in king of shivet gzelo, could have said you return your stolen item, meaning the one you stole. Asher gazal lamali lemichtav shmami natarte. The fact that it uses instead of his stolen item, it could have said that. Instead, it said the stolen item that he stole. So from there, you can derive two things, and that's how we get to both of them.
That's the first version of Rav Chisim, the neighbor of Rabbi Yonatan. That basically agrees with Rabbah. He uses the exact same source as Rabbah. And then we just had a, a question about how could you learn that if we learn something else? And then he figured out how we could do both. But Ika da Amr, some people say that Amr of Chista, Amr Rabbi Yonatan, that what he said was actually the opposite. Minayin le Shinoi she'eno kone. How do you know that Shinoi is not kone? Shinema ve'eshiva tagzela mikolako. It says, return the stolen item. Why does it say the stolen item? However it is, whatever form it's in, it doesn't make a difference that you changed it. No matter what, you have to return that stolen item. So if you took a piece of wood and you turned it into a vessel, you have to give them the vessel. But what do you do with Asher Gazal? Sounds like as it is at the time that you stole it. Now here's the opposite of what we said before. Oh, that? We need that for a different drasha. And only one, and not two things. We're going to drasha from there. And there we have a totally different version, which we now learn that some people, perhaps, we don't know, but perhaps, at least those who thought that this is what Rav Chista said in the neighbor of Yonatan, that maybe Shino isn't Kona. So we thought yesterday it was not a subject of debate. Now we see perhaps it is. Now we're going to go back to Yehosh. We're having a bit of a strange order because we started with Shinoi. We moved to Yehosh. We go back to Shinoi and now we're moving back to Yehosh. And now we're going to bring two sources from other people. If you notice, by the way, when Rav Yosef disagreed with, with Rava and said Yehosh is in Kona, he didn't say why. He just said, right, if you remember, Rava said Yehosh is Kona either on a Torah level or on a rabbinic level. And all Rav Yosef said was, it's not Kona even on a rabbinic level. But he didn't say why. So now we're going to have some sources for why we know that Yehosh isn't Kone. Amar Ula, minayin liyehosh she'eno Kone. Shneema, and this is a sukkah we saw already in sukkah a very long time ago, and we learned about lulava gazul, that you can't use, right? Mitzvah ba'aba vera. You can't use, do a mitzvah with something that was used for a sin, meaning something you stole. Ve'heveta gazul eta piseach ve'eta chole. Sorry, ve'heveta. This is a Pesach from Malachi, and it says basically you're bringing things that are stolen to use as, as sacrifices, and you're bringing lame animals, which is a blemished animal that you can't bring, and sick animals. And then it says at the end of the Pesach, God says, you think this is what I want? Meaning, these are not valid at all. Now, if you notice in the Pesach, there's gazul, stolen, and there's lame, pisach. So they're going to assume that the gazul is like the pisach. In what way? We'll see right now. Gazul dumia de pisach. So the gazul must be like the pisach because they appear in the same verse together. Ma pisach de lele takanta klal. Just like a pisach has no takana, there's no way to fix it. Once it's, it's a blemish that will never go away, it can never be fixed, the animal will never be able to go on the altar. Moving now to Amabet, af gazul de lele takana. Likewise, something stolen will never be able to be fixed. What do you learn from here? You can never bring a stolen item on the altar because it will never become yours. Okay? Never. Just like the Pesach can never be brought, something stolen can never be brought because even if the original owner, if Ruth steals from Naomi and Naomi says, oh, I never want this item back, it doesn't become, Ruth never becomes the owner of that item. Yehosh alone is not Kone. That's why Ruth can never bring it on the altar because it will never be hers. It will never be owned by her. It will always be considered a stolen item. right? Theoretically, if you say Yehush is Kone, then the item no longer becomes a stolen item because when Ruth gives the money back to Naomi, the value of it, right, plus let's say the Kefel or if there's Arba Abba Hamisha, once she pays, it's no longer stolen. The stolen title is off of it if you hold it Yehush causes it to be acquired by her. So this proves not. Rava Amar Mehacha. Rava brings a different source, which is a little bit strange because you'll see what Rava does with this source. If you remember yesterday's Shior, you'll see that Rava explained this source in a totally different way on yesterday's stuff. So first it was brought in in one way and then it was explained in a different way. So let's see. Rava Amar Mehacha. Korbano Veloa Gazul. Remember this is, right? You're supposed to bring your Korban, Korban Ola, and not a stolen Korban. It's the same idea as the previous source. It's just a different Rasha that the, the korban ola that you bring has to be your own. What does it mean your own? Well, not a stolen one. Amat, in which case would this be? So again, the, we're assuming right now, which is what we did yesterday, was the first assumption of how to read this pasuk. In this case, it's going to be the assumption of how to read this pasuk. In yesterday, Staff Rava rejected and explained the pasuk differently in the end, that the pasuk is referring to a case where I stole, where Ruth steals an animal from Naomi and then wants to sanctify the animal and bring it to the temple. 
So Elim Alifnye Yeush, if she steals Naomi's animal and Naomi still wants to get the animal back, she wasn't she didn't despair of getting it back, no Yeush, Lamalika. What do you get Pasik for? For sure Ruth can't take an item of Naomi's that's not ownerless and say, I'm sanctifying it. No one can ever sanctify an item that belongs to somebody else. El Alav, so you wouldn't need a Pasuk to teach you that. That's totally obvious. El Alav la'achar Yehush, it must be after Yehush, u'shmamina, Yehush lo kana shmamina. And that's the conclusion. Rava says from here, what do you see? As opposed to in yesterday's Dafu, Rava rejected that assumption and explained it in a different way. We basically say, oh, Yehush clearly isn't Kone, even if Naomi says, I don't really want this animal anymore anyway. And Ruth, it's in her possession already because she stole it. So once Naomi says, I'll never get this back, Ruth can theoretically, it becomes hers and she can bring it as a korban. The fact that this doesn't allow for that shows that it never becomes hers. And therefore, you see that Yehush is Kona. To which the Gemara asks the question that I already said, which is, But Rav on yesterday's staff rejected that interpretation and said, it's not that Ruth is trying to sanctify this item and is it hers to sanctify or not. No, it's that she stole someone else's korban. When she stole it from Naomi, Naomi had already designated this animal for a korban. It wasn't a chulin, that a non-sacred item that she turned into a sacred item. It wasn't sacred to, it was already sacred to begin with. And then what did we explain? We explained two things, but we'll go with the second interpretation. If Naomi has Yeush, it's irrelevant because it doesn't belong to Naomi anymore. When Naomi said this is going to be a sacrifice, she was no longer the owner. It's owned by the temple, even though she hasn't brought it yet. It's technically owned by the temple. Her Yeush is irrelevant. She can't give up ownership rights because it doesn't, it's not owned by her. So of course, Ruth can't bring that to the temple. It'll never become hers, but that has nothing to do with Yeush. So how could Rav here bring this as the source for Yeush's in Kone when yesterday he rejected this explanation and gave a different one to that source? So Ibai Dei Mahadarbe, one option is he just changed his mind. He thought that the source was talking about that yesterday. And today, right, we don't know when it was, but yesterday's stuff. And now he changes his mind. Ibai Dema, Chaminai or Rav Papa Amara. They were both quoting the name of Rapa, but maybe it was a mistake. And one of them was really quoted by Rav Papa. No, where we pull Rav Papa out of a hat. Rav Papa was Rav's student. So sometimes you get confused as to whether the student said it or the teacher. Could be they heard Rav Papa and assumed it was Rava when it wasn't. It was really Rav Papa. Okay, we don't know which one was said by Rava and which one by Rav Papa. Okay, that's the end of that section. So again, what we did was we talked about Shinoi. Rav says Shinoi is Kone. And then Rav said Yeush is Kone also. Then we move. This is already from yesterday. Then we moved to Rav Yosef, who disagreed about the Yeush and said Yeush isn't Kone. We brought two questions on Rabbi yesterday and answered them. We brought two sources, both yesterday, one and today, the other, and we finished the first one today. Two questions against Rav Yosef and resolved them. Then we moved to show that perhaps two different versions. There's someone who either supports Rabbi about Shinoi or that Shino is Kone or says, no, Shino isn't Kone. And that's a unique opinion that we just saw now that we hadn't seen before. Then we got into two sources for how we know that Yehush is in Kone, going back to Rav Yosef and supporting Rav Yosef's opinion, or perhaps they were just not necessarily trying to support it, but bringing up their own opinions that Yehush is in Kone. Okay, now we're moving to the next part of the mission. Midat tashlumer ba'ava This four or five times payment is only shore and se. Okay, not any other animals. To which the Gemara has a good question based on sugyas that we learned earlier in the Masechet. Ve'ema ne'lev shor shor mishabat. Why don't we learn Gzeira Shava? It says Shor in our Pasuk, and it says Shor in Shabbat. If you remember, we had that whole Drashav Shabbat because it says Vechol Ba'em Techa. Vechol is the reboy, includes all animals. And then it says Shor and Chamor. What are those used for? Oh, to make Gzeira Shavas to all sorts of other places where Shor and Chamor appear in the Torah that we're going to learn from there all animals, not just Shor or Chamor, but all animals, all birds. And we had a whole big discussion about that. So here it says shore and se. Why don't we say, oh, it says shore, just like it says shore and Shabbat. And there it means all animals. That was about not doing work on Shabbat. Your animals can't work. And we said it means all animals. Right? All animals, all undomesticated animals as well. And birds. Afkan. Just like there. Also here it should be chayava of chayotzebehen. Maybe this four times or five times payment should be there as well. I'm a rava. No. Rabbi says, Amakra, Shol Vese, Shol Vese Shne Pa'amin. It appears in the verse. We'll read the verse in one minute. Shol and Se appear twice in the Pasuk. Why twice? To basically say, Shol Vese in Midiachrinilo. Okay? To say, 
only Shorva said this doesn't apply to anything else. So now let's read the Pasuk. Ki ginov ish shor ose. If a person steals a shor or a se, right, a, a bull or a sheep, utvacho omecharo, and then slaughters it or sells it, right? This is kind of stage two. We'll see at the end of the daf, the, the Rabbi Akiva says, you're mishtaresh betamar. What's so bad? Why do you have to pay this four or five payment? Because not only did you steal it, but you did something with it. You either slaughtered it, which destroyed it really, or you sold it to someone else. That's already step two. You're liable for that even more. Chamisha bakal yeshalem tachar ashol. They're shore the second time. You're going to pay five cattle in place of the shore and arbatzon tachar aseh. And four from the sheep family, four of your livestock in place of the se. Okay, so now, se and shore appear twice, but the Gemara is going to have to explain, and this is one of those kind of long-winded and sometimes you don't really understand all the logic of it, but uh, we'll do our best that we can. Amri Hemiyate, which one is unnecessary? In other words, theoretically, try to read that pasuk. We're going to have three reasons of that pasuk. How could the pasuk of Reb without shore and se appearing twice? Theoretically, you need it. You need to say, what did you steal? A shore or a se? And then what do you pay? This in place of the shore, this in place of the se. So theoretically, you really need both. So something's going to have to be unnecessary. So option one is to say, Elam a shore said to say from Yatu. Maybe the end. And I would start with, you stole a shore or a se, and then say, the Nixar Brahmana, let's read it. Ki, here's their suggested reading, which could have worked, but they're going to say no. Ki, you know, shore or se, utvacho omecharo. It says umecharo, but that's not the pasuk. It's, it's, a, it's a mistake in this whole so It should say or. It's either slaughtering or selling. Chamisha bakal yishalem takta va'ar batzon takta. And if you're smart, you realize that you should pay five cattle in place of it. In place of what? In place of the shore, obviously. And if it's the tzon, which is from the sheep, is a part of the tzon family, then it would be arbat tzon in place of the sheep. That would kind of be obvious. Well, no. Because ikat avrachman hachi, if it had said that, and here's going to be all sorts of things you would have thought had it said that, even though you might say, I don't know, but I would have thought that. Ha'amamina bayin shilume tisha'a l'chol echad. If you steal a shore or a se, then you have to pay either one, let's say. So let's say you steal a shore. You'd have to pay. Chamisha bakar yishalem tachtav, arbatzon tachtav. You'd have to pay nine animals altogether. For that one bull you sold, maybe you'd have to pay five cattle and four from the sheep family. But if you want to say, no, I wouldn't have thought that because it says tachtav twice. It says five bakar in place of eight. And for its own, in place of it, so it each time obviously means one time the shore, one time the se, which again would seem it's unnecessary at the end. No, because that, ha-hu, that extra taftav, the fact that it says it twice, me baile le drashachrina is needed for a different drashad, the tanya, as it says in a bright Yachol ganav shor shavem anei shalem taftav negidin. You might have thought if you steal a very expensive shore that's worth 100 zoos, maybe you could pay five negidin, five weak Shvalim that are about to die, you know, maybe you could just get away with and technically say, oh, here are five, you know, junkie Shvalim. Talmud Lomar, Tachtav, Tachtav. It says Tachtav twice to say in place of it, meaning it has to be like the shore that you stole. Ella, shore, okay. So therefore, in the end, you could have thought that you would have to get to nine for just one. That's why you need the shore and set also at the end. Okay, so option number one is out. So, obviously, what's option number two? El ha-shor v'seh d'reish ha-miyater. So, the shor v'seh in the beginning of the pasuk is unnecessary. D'nech t'rachmani, you could just say, ki ignov ish, utvachol mecharof, a man stole something, and slaughtered, and or sold it. It should be o mecharof. Chamisha bakar yishalem tachad ha-shor v'ar b'tzon tachad ha-seh. Well, at the end already, you say, well, if it was a shor, then you pay five. And if it was a seh, you pay four, which seems to make it pretty obvious it's either or. To which they say, and then you don't need it in the beginning. No. And here's where it gets a little confusing, all these, what you would have thought. You might have thought you have to steal both, because in the beginning it didn't say either or, which it does in the pasuk, but if you got rid of the word shore or se, you might think you have to steal them both. And then, right, and you'd have to steal them both and slaughter them both in order to be liable. And then you pay five on account of the fact that you slaughtered, stole and slaughtered the, the bull, and four on account of the fact that you slaughtered and stole a, a set. But we would think that it would only be if you did all, both of them, would you be liable? They say you can't possibly have thought that because it says, and you slaughtered it. It doesn't say which would be plural. To only one. 
So they say, well, you still could have thought. You would have to steal both of them, sell both of them, but only slaughter one of them. So they say, well, you definitely can't think it's that because again, you have to change it. In the passage it says, or sold. It doesn't mean you have to steal. Right Again, we were saying steal to, sell to, and um, and and all, and slaughter one because actually right now they're saying and it, it also says umicharo is also singular only the selling needs to be one so you can't say the selling has to be both so lechad right that again means only one maybe you would think that you have to steal two and then slaughter one and sell one because now you have it's true tavach is singular and machar is singular but maybe it means steal two Slaughter one, sell one. Well, that you can't say because omecha hokti, because it says or. It's either slaughtering or selling. It's not both. So there's no way you could have thought that you would have to steal two, sell one, slaughter one. But akate havamina, again, this is a little bit ridiculous, right? But they're, okay. The aima, they're just trying to say why it's not clear, clear, clear that the first two are unnecessary. Akate havamina adgan of travayu vitabechadam asharachad. You still might have thought you still have to steal both because it didn't say sure or in the beginning. And then, eat and slaughter one and leave the other one. Oh, mezabin chadam asharachat. And then that would deal with the tfacho or mecharo. And the selling or the slaughtering, whichever one you do, could only be with one and then the other one you didn't do anything with and still you'd have to pay the five against this and the four against that. But that's why you needed the pasuk to say both in the beginning, steal this or that and sell this or that, so that you don't think it, we meant steal two animals. Ella, so that doesn't work at all. Third option, Ella, and this will be the final. What's left? If the first two aren't unnecessary, and the second two aren't unnecessary, so how could we possibly get to anything? Well, creativity here. Ella shor de seifa deresha. It's the shore in the end, and the se in the beginning. Now they're going to have a good way to read. You could have read the pasuk. Denich tabrachman of the following. You could have said, ki ignov ishol. And the topic being ashore, if you sell, if you steal a bull, utvacho omecharo, and you slaughter or sell it, chamisha bakari shalem tachtav, you pay five in place of that shore. Ve'ar batzon tachad aseh, and then what you would assume the pasuk is saying is, and if it were to happen with a set, you pay four in place of the set, and that actually could have worked. And then you basically got rid of the set in the beginning of the pasuk. There's no need for the shore at the end of the pasuk. Uh, sorry, you got rid of the. Right, and the, sh- the shore you got rid of at the end of the pasuk because you were only talking about a shore, so obviously you meant the shore at that point. So, shore de sefer v'seh de reisha lamali, shma mina shore v'seh imi diachrini lo. Because those are both unnecessary, we learn just those, nothing else. Okay, now we get to the last part of the Mishnah. If Ruth steals from Naomi, and then I steal from Ruth, I don't have to pay her kefa. Sounds pretty basic, because it's not hers, but wait a minute. Didn't we learn that it does somewhat become hers? And in fact, Rav says the following. Amarav lo shanu ela lifnei yeush. Back to our topic of yeush. That's only if Naomi doesn't give up hopes of getting it back. Because then basically I'm stealing Naomi's item that's in Ruth's hands. So I don't have to pay careful because I stole it from Ruth. I didn't steal it from Naomi, who's the rightful owner. But la'achar yeush, this is if you hold yeush's kone, kina'o ganav rishon. So if, right, Yehush is Kone, and Naomi says, I'll never get that back again, it becomes Ruth's to the extent that she even gets the Kefal payment. Now, first of all, she has to pay Naomi the value and the Kefal. But if I steal it from Ruth, Ruth becomes the owner of that item. That's what we've been saying all along. If you hold Yehush is Kone, then Ruth becomes the rightful owner. If I steal it from her, it's basically like stealing from the owner. And I have to pay Kefal. That's what Rav says. To which Rav Shesha comes in. This is the third time in our Masecha Rav Shesha says this to Rav. Favorite line. Amina ki naim v'shachiv Rav amal ha-shmata. He must have been sleeping when he said the following thing. Deitanya, as it says in a bright time. Amar Rabbi Akiva mipnei ma'am ra Torah tavach u'machar m'shalem tashlumei arba'a v'chamisha mipnei shen nishtaresh v'chet. Why do you pay four or five double, uh, four or five times the payment according to Rabbi Akiva? Because you really like got deep into the sin. Now, what they assume right now is if it was before Yehush, and Ruth basically stole Naomi's item, slaughtered it, or sold it to me. In this case, we're talking, she, right, she sells it to me. The item is still Naomi's. 
So it's not like Ruth did anything so bad to it because it still really belongs to Naomi because she didn't have Yehush. Ella must be Lachar Yehush. In other words, the sale Ruth does to me, if it's still Naomi's, it's an invalid sale. So you can't say it's Nishtaresh, it got deeper into, you know, got, like she basically made it much worse. Because in the end, it's still Naomi's and I'll just have to return it to Naomi. It must be Lachar Yehush. And what does Rabbi Akiva say? Nishtaresh. That basically it must be after Yehush. We'll leave the rest for tomorrow as to why Rav Shesha really didn't like this. The important part is the next line, which we'll get into tomorrow. And then we'll understand better why Rav Shesha uh, says Rav must have been sleeping when he said this. There's no way that this is what he said. We saw today a difficulty on Rav Yosef, right? We finished up the first difficulty. We brought the second difficulty against him. We said that Yehush is in Kone. We said, what about this, right? We end up saying, well, Yehush with Shino Hashem, Yehush with a little bit of Shino Yamase. And with that, we resolve. And then we brought the other case, which was also a Shino Hashem, Tevel to Truma, Chulin to Hekdesh, Shino Hashem. Then we had two different girsa out of Rabbi Yonatan, quoted by Rabbi Chista, about whether he agrees with Rabba that Shino is Konen, and everyone else, you know, we thought everyone all agreed also about it. Or does he actually have a different drasha and thinks that, Ye- that Shino, sorry, I hope I didn't say Yehosh, Shino is Konen. And, or maybe he thinks Shino isn't Kone. And then we go back to Yehush, and we bring two sources for Yehush, how we know Yehush is Kone. Then we go to Tashlomay Abba Abba Hamisha, how do we know it's just Shor and Seh? And that's because it says twice in the Pasuk. We spent a while trying to figure out which ones were extra in the Pasuk, so we got to the Shor at the end and the Seh in the beginning. Those were the extra words. And then we started this thing about the Goneva Haragana, Mishalem Tashlomay Kefel. We started with Rav, who narrows it, and then Rav Sheshed, who we didn't really get to yet, who disagrees with Rav. And that we'll deal with tomorrow. Wishing everyone a good day and Good news. Hoping still for good news in the days to come.